was taken to hell and he saw the devil's secret weapon that is sending millions that think they're Christians to hell. At 26, um, you had a blood clot uh, that resulted in, uh, in his death. And as a matter of fact, this was a while ago. This was in 1978. I'm going to take you back to the time you just got out of the hospital. It's 9.20 p.m. Something woke you by grabbing you. What was that? Yeah, Sid, I, I got home from the hospital. I, you know, funny, I, mm. I went to sleep at nine, around 9.20. Something grabbed a hold of my left wrist. And when it did this, it pulled me right up out of the bed. I mean, it just jerked me out of the bed like I was nothing, like I was a rag doll. And, you know, I tried to fight it. You know, that's the first instinct you have. Of course. And so I was trying to do this, and this, this thing, I realized all of a sudden that, hey, this is a demon. And I knew instantly I was going to hell. Hmm. And I knew that's where I was heading. And so this demon took me, and I, I, could, I started hearing these screams. I started smelling this awful smell. And this demon just kept taking me, and it just kept traveling. I mean, you feel you were going. And this demon took me to hell. And I'm in hell, and I'm looking around in hell, and I'm seeing all these different people, even people I recognize, even some from my childhood that I saw. I saw former pastors. I you, saw, you saw people that you felt were Christians. Oh, yes, yes. Mm. I felt it. Well, see, one of the things that happens is when you're in the spirit after you pass on, when you look at somebody else, you instantly know everything about them. There doesn't have to be communication because you know everything about them. So what happens is that you're looking at these people and you're, you're kind of speaking to them and they're telling you and you just read everything that's happening in their life. So you know exactly what they did. And it, it's amazing because these are not people you would expect to see there. You just wouldn't. But yet these people are in hell and they're tortured. And, and the torturing that goes on there, Sid, is unbelievable. But the thing that I think is the lasting impression on me was the hopelessness. Because Sid, when you're in hell, there's no hope. I mean, you're done. Once that happens, you're done. There's no hope. Because when you try to pray, it's like an iron ceiling or, or iron dome over you. It goes nowhere. You know, you're done. You had your chance when you, you were here on earth. And now you're down there and, you're, and I'm watching these people as they're being tortured. They can't move. They're solid. They're put in a place. I don't see an actual chain, but it's as if there's a chain around them and they can't move. They can swing their hands around and move their feet around, but they're not going anywhere. And these demons are attacking them and attaching to them. You saw millions of people that have bought lies while in earth that were churchgoers yeah. in hell. What was the cause? Sid, the, one of the biggest causes are that people believe that all you have to do is just do one little thing to accept Jesus. Say and, a prayer with Billy, so to Right, speak. And, and then you can do whatever you want in life. And that's not true. You can't do that. There's, it, it, no, what about the current teaching that says, well, once you accepted the Lord, His grace takes care of past, present, and future sins. There's nothing you have to do about it. Um, that's not in the Bible. Of course not. It, and not only is it not in the Bible, that's sending so many people to hell, it's unreal. You would be surprised. There, listen, you can't, you can't just say, okay, once you do it, that's it. Because it tells you in the Bible, certain people, certain things, you can't enter the kingdom of heaven. Now, I don't care who you are, you can't. It doesn't matter if you're, if you're telling little lies and you think, oh, I'm okay, I'm getting uh, just little white lies. No, there's still problems. You, know, you have to daily just say, I do every day before I go to sleep, Lord, just forgive me of anything. I just do that on a daily basis. In fact, if I catch myself doing something wrong, I instantly want to correct that because I've been there. Mm -hmm. I don't want to go back there. I don't want anybody to ever go there. Uh, she even met Jesus, visited heaven, but one day found herself and many other Christians in hell. She now knows the hell conspiracy. Now you are about to know what hell has purposely kept hidden from you. It's hell's best kept secret, and I'm gonna blast it now. 
In 2008, right. God took you to hell. Yeah. And here's the sad thing. She saw some of her relatives there. She saw many Christians there. I know that's hard to believe, but you'll understand when we come back. I know you will. You're at a conference in prayer in 2008 at IHOP. You're in a prayer, prayer there, and suddenly, did you real? When did you realize you were in hell? What, 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 tell me what happened. So um, we were in evangelism meeting. The I was worshiping in the back with my eyes closed, and then as soon as those, as soon as the heat came in the room, I watched. I opened my eyes. I knew something was happening. I opened my eyes. The front of the room opened like this, Sid, and hell was right there, and a arm without fingers came flying out of hell, and it grabbed a hold of my spirit, and it sucked me in, and those hell doors are thick, and they're heavy, and when they slammed shut, I knew exactly where I was immediately. Three things were spoken over me. You are in hell eternally for unforgiveness. And, and there, the, the worst regret you can ever imagine was, was right then, because there's no way out. You, I knew that there was no way out of hell. First, I want to say there's no way that I will ever be guilty of uh, exaggerating hell. There are not enough. Why would words. you not exaggerate? Why would you not exaggerate? It's worse than any words that I can come up with. Mm. Uh, when I got there, just the heat, the extreme heat, started causing my skin to drip off of me. And the sound of the people screaming broke my eardrums and caused such a pain inside of me. And I knew this was going to go on eternally. And there was no way out of it. My bones, my body twisted in so many ways, breaking. I felt my back break. Did you feel pain in hell? A excruciating pain. And there is not one drop of relief. There's not a drop of water. There's not, there's, there's not a drop of light. You can never get to another human being to share that pain. You actually become uh, sin. You, you start looking like this growth. You actually lose the formation of a human being because I'm made in the image of God, and that changed there. It, it, it's horrific. It's horrific. I never want to go back. Imagine trying to live your life with no God. I was never going to touch my grandbaby's face again. Even arguing with my husband, not that that's cool, but you were never going to get to do any of that. You were never going to get to say you were sorry. You were never going to fix anything. To always be in pain and to know that it was, it kept ramping up and it was going to keep getting worse and worse and worse. And it was never going to end. That was the thing. It, it wasn't like you could reach a pinnacle. In, in hell, it worked the same as in heaven. My full brain operated. And I knew, I knew all of Matthew 18. I knew every scripture that I'd ever read, and I've read the whole Bible. I knew every scripture that I've ever read, and it made complete sense, and it was completely righteous that I was in hell. And I, I, became, I, I became hate. I hated, and I continued to hate. And there were people there. They were just like me. They believed Jesus is the Lord God, but they refused to obey him. They say, we love you, we love you, but the scriptures teach, if you love me, then obey me. And, and I wouldn't, I wouldn't forgive. And, it was the worst, it was the worst thing to know that in heaven Jesus had been so patient and he was willing to forgive me everything, everything. And I couldn't forgive small offenses. I mean, in my life, they, they felt like these things had broken me. 
But in reality, to everything that the Lord had forgiven me of, said they were small. Uh, how, how did you get out of hell? As quickly as I went into hell, these doors opened and something brought me out so fast, I entered, re-entered the room, I was screaming. The, my friend who was running the meeting, he came to the back because I was so disruptive and he started shaking me. This is at the IHOP. Yeah, yeah, he's here. You know, my good friend, Hal Linhart, he was there and he was shaking me, he asking me, what's wrong, what's wrong, what's wrong? And I said to him, I've been to hell. And everything changed in that minute. As transforming as it was to go to heaven and meet Jesus Christ, that transformation does not compare to the transformation of having been to hell. I'm going to have her share the biggest lies that Christians believe that will cause them to not make heaven. Be right back. Is the biggest lie of the devil out there. Once saved, always saved. And, and it's understanding as I, as I bump into people, I think that is a hell conspiracy. I think it's the biggest lie because the idea behind that, Sid, is that I'm going to give my life to Jesus today. He'll wipe away all my past sins, and it doesn't matter how I live anymore. I can, I can. But that's can. the new revelation of grace, not the biblical revelation. Correct. What you're about to hear, you have never heard before. I think maybe two other people have had a similar experience, but this is not a dream. This is not a vision. This is an encounter and visitation of Jesus Christ and a literal visit to hell. When I was 24 years old, all of a sudden there was quiet, like a stillness or something while I was sitting on my couch. Then all of a sudden, Jesus Christ walked through my door. He created matter. He doesn't have to open doors. He walked up to me and said, son, very important word, son, come with me. His face was like the brightness of the sun, and I was as were dead. John was right. That's how it is. Only way you can explain it. His garments were white, like, like perfect white. My spirit knew, as I knew, my consciousness knew, and I knew that this was Jesus Christ. My spirit obeyed when he said, come. Spirit said, this is him. He is God. <laughs> right out of my mouth, making it obvious that this wasn't a vision and I knew this wasn't a dream, so it's not a dream, it's not a vision. This is literally, boom, this is what happened. Sorry, that's what happened. We went through the earth. I could see the layers of it. He's on my right-hand side. As we go to the earth, I see the center of the earth, and it's a pit. And it's got more to it, but that's what I'm talking about here. It's a pit. And in there there's people that were in my church and they were in hell that stop he that hears out he that judges a matter before he hears the whole thing is folly listen to what i have to say no matter how educated or intelligent you are listen to me i was a calvinist i was a dean at everlasting chip ministries an accredited school where you get your bachelor's master's degree i taught greek I knew as I studied Greek that the Greek was refuting Calvinism. I knew that men who taught it had to twist it because I knew that the word believeth is a present tense imperative verb. You can't connect anything else in the scripture such as shall and everlasting life without connecting it in conjuncture to the word believeth. But People twist the word as scripture says. For every text, there must be a context or, or it is a pretext. I'm just telling you like it is. I saw people in my own church telling, saying to me, Pastor John, you told us 
we couldn't lose our salvation. Now, this is for eternity. I'm going to hear this. There's no place to go. There's no place to run. It's not a TV. You can't turn it off. Your brain doesn't shut it down. You can't fall asleep. You're forever awake. You fully, completely understand it because even though you're in a spirit, you completely can hear and see. You're there. You can't deny it. Then I... In the, in the middle of this, I'm put into a tomb. The Lord tells me, son, if you continue to believe what you believe and preach it, this is going to be your punishment. And I'm put into this tomb. And in this tomb, I see like, uh, like a spider. I see like a monkey. And I, and, I, and I see a spider, a monkey, and I see a rat. And I'm in this tomb, and I can hear billions of voices. But I can ascertain and understand them. Now, your frontal cortex, where you make your decisions and your cognitive facilities, right? That's where it all happens. It can't process that. Your ears can't assimilate and process all of that. But when you're out of your body, you can. So we can handle, we sometimes maybe get in getting insulted or condemned by people or accused, and it hurts. But how about billions of voices cursing you, jeering you, making fun of you, tormenting you, lying to you, messing with your mind, millions of them, hearing each one of them, understanding each one of them. Each one of those, boom, shoots in there, boom, hits you, deep inside your heart, deep inside your spirit. It hits you, but you can't escape it. It's for eternity. There's no reprieve. You've done the deed, you're there. You lied. You preached a false gospel. You told people they were eternally secure, though you knew as a person who studied Greek and Hebrew, it wasn't feasible. You twisted it because you didn't want to hear the truth. And now you're there. And there's no way out. You can't say, God, I repent now. I'm sorry. I didn't know because everybody knows the truth. You're just twisting the truth. You're twisting it. You can become to a point where strong delusion causes you actually to believe the lie. But I wasn't there. I hadn't seared my conscience. So I hadn't gone over like a lot of Calvinists have gone over. They've seared their consciences. And outside of a supernatural miracle, they will never, ever make it to heaven because they've seared their conscience. They simply believe their brains are cooked. That, that, that pickle's been left in pickle juice too long. And now it, it's got the, the bitter taste of vinegar. Yeah, I believe a person can probably repent till the time they're gone, but it's going to be hard. I, I believed in Calvinism, but anytime I studied in Greek and Hebrew, it, I knew that it, 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 you really intellectually couldn't do that. I knew you had to be basically uh, illiterate with the Greek to really be a Calvinist or just a plain liar, but I still believed in Calvinism anyways. So I'm in hell. I see the lake of fire. Now, do I see fire? No. You say, oh, wait a second. Oh, no. Oh, I saw outer darkness. In outer darkness, there was a lake. I knew it was a lake. I could see that it was a lake. And people were bobbing up and down in this lake, the people that I had deceived, in the lake of fire. And they were crying out, Pastor John, you deceived us. They were in this lake, but there was outer darkness. Remember, hell is outer darkness. The worst thing in the world is darkness. There, God is light, and in him there is no darkness at all. The absence of light is darkness. God isn't going to be there. He's not showing up. There's complete darkness there. Talk about claustrophobia. Nowhere to go. Nowhere to run. Complete darkness in flames. Being burned alive. No ability to change. Repent. I'm sorry. Fix it. This is it. Forever. Tormented. Demons cursing you. Lying to you. You're there and you're there because you've been a liar. You're there because you're a backslider or you're, you're, you're a lukewarm Christian. You're there because you're a false prophet and you told people that you, what you knew could not be taught intelligently, articulately from the Greek. You taught it anyways and you're a liar and you knew it. And now God says, it doesn't matter. Nobody will con me. Nobody can, can lie to me and get away with it. You're here for eternity. If you believe in Calvinism, if you believe you can be lukewarm or you can be a backslider, make it into heaven, you better run. You better run because you won't be able to hide in any rock when Christ comes in the fullness of his glory. And I've had visions of him coming back. You'll not be able to hide. 
You're not going to have a discussion. It's over. It's over. Run from Calvinism. Run from sin. Run to God. Repent and keep on repenting. Call and keep on calling. Seek and keep on seeking. God bless you. Hello everyone, my name is Joseph. Just because you have accepted Jesus Christ as your Savior does not give you a license to sin willfully. Yes, we're going to slip up from day to day, maybe with a bad thought, or you might slip with some profanity. I understand that. But in Hebrews 10.26, For if we sin willfully, after that we have received the knowledge of the truth, there remaineth no more sacrifice for sins. Okay? So I'm talking to the people here who believe in once saved, always saved. You know, you say that you're sealed with the Holy Spirit, but that does not give you a license to sin, okay? So I'm going to ask a person here. Let's say you are saved, once saved, always saved. That's what you believe. Now I'm talking to a married man here. I'm a Christian, let's say. I believe in the Lord, but I have my weaknesses. Would it be okay for me to have an affair with your wife and commit adultery. Is that okay with you, sir? Oh, I don't think so. Correct. You see what I'm trying to say? But you just said one saved, always saved. Now, I'm talking to a single mom here. Let's say I'm saved. I believe in Jesus, okay? But I have a problem with children. Would it be okay if I molest your child? Would you be okay with that? Oh, you wouldn't. Of course you wouldn't. Because, you know, you just said, though, once saved, always saved. Do you see the point I'm trying to make, people, here? It's if you sin willfully. If you sin willfully, there remaineth no more sacrifice for sins. This is the point I'm trying to make here, okay? Now, I re-uploaded my video. It's about 35 minutes long. As every minute goes by, it gets very intense, okay? The Lord told me to upload this video, to re-upload it. And I, I really would like you people to watch it. By the time you're done watching it, it's like 35 minutes long. If you still think once saved, always saved is true doctrine, then I don't know what to tell you. For me, I sinned willfully after I accepted Jesus as my Savior, and I got sent to hell, and the Lord told me that the wages of sin is death, and that if I don't repent, I was going straight to hell. Okay? So please watch my testimony, and, and just... You know, just watch it, please. Thank you. Hello, everyone. My name is Joseph, and today I am going to be giving you my personal testimony of my near-death experience slash vision, okay? I am redoing this video. For those of you who have seen my other videos, uh, or other video, basically, on my health testimony, I'm redoing it only because that was my first YouTube video. Uh, I made no eye contact with the camera. And I'm not changing things. Uh, I might, you know, add things in the spirit wherever the Lord leads me. Stuff I might have forgotten to tell you. But I'm redoing my hell testimony. So here it goes, okay? I'm going to start by telling you that my name is Joseph. I'm 53 years old. And it is the year 2016. It's January 2nd right now. I'm going to go back to my childhood and then take you through it. So be patient. But I believe when you tell a testimony, you should give background as well. Uh, that's just my opinion on that and my take on that, okay? So basically, I was raised in a family of five boys. My parents worked in factories. You know, they worked in, a, uh, in, in factories. They worked very hard. They raised five boys. When I was 13 years old, I had a brother, and he joined the U.S. Marine Corps, and he went to basic training in Paris Island, and uh, he was 19 years old. I was 14, 13, 14 years old. I was about 13. I was in eighth grade at the time, okay? I believe eighth grade, seventh or eighth grade. I was in junior high. 
And a long story short, basically what happened there was um, my brother joined the U.S. Marines. He went to boot camp in Paris Island, South Carolina. And he, he arrived in boot camp on a Monday, December 1. He died on Wednesday, December 3rd. And his body came back in a casket on Saturday, uh, December 6th, which was my brother's 16th, my other brother's 16th birthday. So a lot of tragedy, you know what I'm saying? And I got called out of school. We all got called out of school by my neighbor, and she brought us all home. And I went through the door, and my mother was crying. And, you know, there was a priest in the house, and the Marines were in the house. And, and my brother was dead, you know, like he died in three days in boot camp. And I was devastated. I was like, are you kidding me? Now I'm 13 years old, so I'm hating God now. I'm hating, I'm hating God. I'm hating the Marine Corps, and I'm hating life, okay? So shortly after, I'm 14 years old. I'm doing drugs. I'm smoking marijuana. I'm doing cocaine at 15, 16 years old, okay? And I got into drugs. I, I just walked away from God at that point, you know, and... Uh, I just, I, I was, uh, I was just uh, bitter. I was bitter and angry. I was hating the world. And I'm just going to tell you this. I was raised Catholic. My parents were Catholic. And, you know, I, I, you know, I was 13 or 14 years old. I made my confirmation in 10th grade. As you know, in a Catholic church, when you make your confirmation, you're accepting Jesus as your Savior. You know, it's no different than being born again. You are accepting Jesus as your Savior, okay? So I'm not condemning the Catholic Church. I'm not in the Catholic Church anymore. I'm not condemning it. I'm giving you a history lesson what happened to me. So I made my confirmation in 10th grade, but I went because my mother made me go. It wasn't in my heart. I hated God. I was mad at God. He took my brother's life. I was smoking marijuana before uh, CCD class. They call it CCD. And I was getting high before the classes when I went, you know, before I made my confirmation. So... There's my, there's my background there, okay? So that's my start of my life. Uh, so then I made my confirmation. Then through, through high school, I fornicated. I had sex. You know, I had a girlfriend having sex out of marriage. And then when I graduated high school, I, I got into drugs. And, you know, I did drugs and drinking and keg parties. And, you know, I just got off track. I hated life. You know, I just hated life. And then, uh, so that went on, you know, 1980, I graduated high school, you know, you know, 81, 82, 1983, four or five, six, and I'm still partying, no direction in life, no career, nothing. I just, I just was going downhill. And then in 1986, okay, so 1980, uh, 1986, I quit smoking marijuana, January, January of 1986, I quit smoking marijuana, I quit drinking, I said, there's got to be something more. There's got to be something more to life, you know, and I'm like, I just, I was unhappy. I was searching for truth, okay? Um, so January of 1986, I quit smoking uh, marijuana. I quit doing cocaine. I was drinking at the time. I quit all of that. In June of 1986, I started my own video production company, and I worked out of my parents' house. It was ridiculous, actually. You know, I had two VCRs and a camcorder. You know, back then it was VHS, you know, but, you know, I started my own career. It started very slow. And I ended up becoming very successful, but we'll get to that later. So anyway, January of 86, I quit partying. June of 86, started my own video production company. In September, like I'm saying, okay, so I quit doing drugs. I quit having sex too. I quit having sex. I stopped dating. And like I'm, I'm trying to, I'm trying, I'm seeking God. I'm seeking truth, you know. So I went back to the Catholic Church in September of, uh, of 1986. And no disrespect to the Catholic Church, but I couldn't get anything out of it. There was nothing... There was no substance. There was no truth in it for me. So then I left. The, I, I was going to the Catholic Church for a couple months. And then I was in the Yellow Pages. Okay, yeah, that shows my age. There was there was no internet back then. So you know we're talking 1986, and I got into the Yellow Pages and I found a Christian uh, Christian place in a in a town that's over from me here, and he told me that you know that that's good that you're seeking. Then he directed me to another church in another town, and I and, and I went to that Christmas service. Now now hear me out. No drugs, no women. I repented from my sins. I just stopped. You know, I didn't even know what repentance was. I just stopped sinning, but I didn't realize I was repenting, okay? But I stopped doing everything for a year, and I went into this church, okay? It was Christmas service, 1986, and I went forward on an altar call, and they said, is there anyone who would like to accept Jesus as their Savior? And I said, wow. I'm like, it, the Lord was like 
I'm telling you, I felt the presence of God right through me. I'm not saying you're all going to feel that, okay, but I did. And God was working on me. You know, he loved me, and he knew I went through so much stuff, you know. And I had stuff happen to me. I, I was abused as a child. I'm not going to go into that. So I had a really bad childhood from when I was 7 till I was 13 years old, okay. And God loved me. And I went forward, and I had tears in my eyes, and I surrendered myself to Jesus. And, and the pastor prayed with me, and the pastor said to me that, you know, you, you've accepted Jesus as your Savior. Um, you're, you're saved by grace, you know, no works you can do, meaning knocking on doors or, you know, uh, donating your time at soup kitchens, meaning you're saved by grace and faith. You have faith in Jesus, and nothing you can do, will, you know, will get you into heaven, meaning you just, you're saved. And he said to me, you're saved for your past sins, your present sins, and your future sins. So I'm like, wow, this is cool. You know, all right. So, okay, that was Christmas service, 1986. In May of 87, I proposed to my wife at the time. I'm divorced now. I'll just speed you right up. I'm not married to her anymore. And I proposed to my I, I accepted my life to Christ in December of 1986. In May of 1987, I proposed to my wife in, uh, in July. I met her in May. I'm sorry here. I met her in May of 87. I proposed in July, and I got married in December. And I was dating all these worldly women back in the day. And she came from, a, you know, she was a born-again Baptist, you know, born-again Christian. So I'm saying, okay, hey, she's saved. I'm saved. Let's get married. And I rushed my marriage, people. You know, I didn't pray about it. I didn't bring it to prayer. I was a brand-new baby Christian, you know. But anyway, you know, I got married, and then, so I got married in 1987, and then the marriage failed. Okay, I'm not going to go into that, but I was married from 1987. I had two children. I still do. They're doing very well. They're older now. And so 1987, I got married. 1997, I got divorced, and that's when it got stupid for me. It got really stupid. Um 1997, I got, went through a bad divorce. I lost a big house. Not that it's about money, but, you know, I lost everything. I lost my finances. I lost relationship with my children. Most importantly, that, that was bad. You know, I lost relationship with my children, okay? Um, it takes two for divorce. I had my sins. She had her sins. Not getting into that here today. The bottom line is that I was married in 1987. I was divorced in 1997, okay? After that, my divorce was so bad, uh, I ran a video production company, okay? As I said, I started my company in 1986. And in 1997, when I got divorced, I was into my video production company 10 years, and my business was jamming. I mean, I was making a lot of money, people. And even, even after my divorce started, my proceedings started, my divorce took a year and a half, okay? But anyway... I got divorced in 1997. My video career took off. You know, I was making money. I had two BMWs. I had two Harley Davidsons. I had a hot tub in the backyard, and I had a big house, and I had any woman I wanted. I'm not pumping myself here. It's not even funny. But back then, I, you know, I had six-pack abs, and I was a pretty boy. You know what I mean? But I was narcissistic. I was selfish. I was, I was living my way, not for Jesus, you know. But I thought I would save people. I'm serious. I'm like, well, God loves me. You know, maybe I just won't get that many rewards when I get into heaven. You know, he knows I have sexual desires. You know what I mean? I have sexual desires. I want to, you know, I want to just, uh, I have I have desires and God understands, you know, and I'm like, he understands what I'm going through. So I figure I just won't get as many rewards in heaven and I'm, I'm in, you know what I mean? So I'm serious, people. Call me blonde, naive, call me what you want. But that pastor told me, he told me I was saved from my past, present, and future sins, and that stuck with me my whole life, my friends, okay? And now that's a big lie, and we're going to get into that later in the video, and I'm going to tell you why. But that's a big lie, my friends. Don't ever let a pastor, priest, minister uh, determine your, your salvation, okay? Read your Bible, and you'll know the truth, okay? I'm not going to get off here. I need to focus. I, need to, I, I can't get off on a different path there. I need to focus now. But what I'm saying to you is that I sinned so bad, people, like, you know, from 1997 all the way until 2004. I'm talking multiple multiple sex with women, multiple women, you know, with sex, uh, drugs, drinking, you know, nothing criminal, you know, nothing criminal there. But anyway, in uh, July 25th, 2004, I was with my, with my existing girlfriend at the time. We were fornicating. We were having sex out of marriage. You know, I never got remarried, okay? And I justified my sins. I'm like, I just, I don't know, maybe I just didn't care. 
I just was serving the world. Like I, I didn't believe in hell or yeah, whatever. You know, I just was like a free for all. It was ridiculous. Okay, so here we go. Here's my testimony. July twenty fifth, two thousand and four. I part partook in drugs with my my girlfriend at the time, and I overdosed on drugs. People, I'm not going to say what drugs I did because I'm not going to promote them here. Okay, there's no need to promote what drugs I did. But I overdosed on drugs, okay? And and what happened to me was I, I all of a sudden I was in this world and in a, in a twinkling of an eye, I'm snapping my fingers here, in a twinkling of an eye, I was in another dimension. I was not on earth here as we know it. Now, I was confined to my house. My body was on the bed, but I was, my soul was wandering in my home. Now, for those of you here who are saved and born again and know the word, you might say, well, that doesn't line up with the word of God. I don't care, my friends, what you think, okay? Uh, just listen to my story. No, I was not in a lake of fire. No, I was not tormented by demons. But what, what, is, scriptural is, uh, it, what, what is scriptural is that the fact that I was eternally separated from God, that is biblical, okay? And here's what happened to me. I was wandering around my house aimlessly, okay? And I'm like going from a room to the other room to another room, and I'm, you know, what's going on here? Like, I, I was like, this is weird. I go, like my phone was there, but I couldn't use it. My um, my front door was there, but I couldn't go out. Like I was a spirit. I can't explain it. I was in my body, but yet I was in my soul. And I was walking around my house in this experience, and my girlfriend at the time was there. And I started to say, something's wrong here, man. And I started getting very paranoid, and, and, and I knew that I was not on planet Earth anymore. I knew that I crossed over. I knew I was in another dimension. I felt like I died, and I was dead. This is how I felt, people, okay? I know the Bible says we are only to die once. I get all that. Just, just bear with me here, please. So I felt like I died, and I crossed over. And I'm wandering around my house aimlessly, and I'm like, I started getting scared fear i have you have no idea i hung around with drug dealers gang members bikers and you know i may not look like i might look like a pretty boy to you but i i had a biker side back in the day and uh i hung around with some rough people but uh nothing scared me as much as what was going on it was mental torment mental anguish okay at one point i picked up my daughter's photos actually i looked at them rather i looked at my daughter's photos on the table and i said i love you guys I miss my kids like you know I love you guys and then like there was no tears my friends I couldn't shed a tear I had no love in me I was hollow it was pure evil okay and then as, as time went on like I could not come to a happy thought meaning I tried to focus on my kids I used to take them to the beach and as soon as I would start thinking about the beach and the sand or whatever boom I was back into fear like, you know what I mean? I couldn't come to a happy time. There's no rest in hell. God showed me that. The Bible says there's no rest in hell. It's 24-7. Torment in hell. And let's talk about that. There is no 24-7. There is no time where I was. People said to me, like, well, how long were you there? There is no time. You were just there. You existed. It was like a magnetic field. You know what I mean? In twinkling of an eye, I was on planet Earth. In a twinkling of an eye, boom, I was in another dimension. That's how fast it happens, my friends, okay? I say, boom, okay, there was no time. It just, I was in an eternal void. And, and the thing of it is, I, I read books later on this stuff. And, and then the most, the, the most craziest thing and the most fearful thing about this experience, my friends, is knowing that you're never getting out. Yes, I'm talking to you here. I got out with the grace of God. You're never getting out, okay? I knew I was never getting out. I'm like, Jesus, help me. I pleaded with Jesus to help me. And I know some of you have uh, near-death videos here, and you call out in the name of Jesus, and he comes to your rescue. And I understand all that. But in my experience, he didn't come. Okay, I was in a dimension of hell. He was nowhere to be found. There was no God at the time. There was no Jesus. I made, you know, they say you make your bed and you're going to lie in it now. Well, I was there for my sins and I knew that. I knew that as my experience started getting more fear, more fear and more fear. And, and, not, and I don't want to say God was revealing it to me because God was never there. I need to point that out to you. Jesus was never, was never there. My, my conscience told me I knew why I was there. I was sinning. I was doing my own thing, and I said to myself out loud, "You've got to be kidding me!" But, but I thought I was like saying that in my in my mind, like, but, 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 but I was like stuttering. But, but, but I thought, you know, that the pastor said, and and I, and I thought that God loved me, and I thought that this, and I thought that that, and it was my sin that got there, my friends, and I knew it as I was. My fear started to kick in. It started to get worse. Started to get worse. Okay, so here's where it gets crazy. Okay, 
I said, I had a Bible in the house. Again, I'm in my soul, I'm in my spirit, but I had a Bible in my house. And I turned to my Bible. I picked up the Bible, my friends, and I opened it up. I said, all right, I'm going to turn to the Word of God, and I'm going to, whatever, I'm going to pray myself out of this. I'm going to pray myself out of hell, okay? Doesn't happen, my friends. I opened my Bible. Okay, hear me out. Look me in the eye here. I opened my Bible, people, and every page was blank. I flipped through the pages, and every page was blank, Okay? I mean, there was no more word of God. It was eternal separation from God. And I'm saying, God, you got to be kidding me. And I said to myself, I didn't say it out loud. I said to myself, oh, my God, I'm in hell. Okay, I was in hell, people. You know, and I couldn't get out. And I was freaking out. And I'm like, God, there was no mercy. There was no grace. Okay? It was because of my unrepentant sins, my willful sins. Okay? I was stuck for all eternity. I was flipping out, man. Okay? So, so then I'm like, I think if I said it out loud, I would have sealed my fate, okay? I would have sealed my fate. I think if I said, oh, my God, I'm in hell. And then and, and so now I'm walking around my house. This is going on and on. And it's still going on. Now I'm like, I'm pondering in my head. I'm like, the Bible pages are blank. There's no more word of God. I'm telling you right now, people, I was in hell. I was in a dimension of hell. And I know it doesn't line up with the lake of fire and tormented by demons and the fire. I understand all that. But I was in a dimension of hell. Okay, God used this experience uh, to teach me that hell is real. Eternal separation, that is biblical. Okay? Uh, so this is where I was. And I was flipping out, people. I was like, I was like, I knew I was never getting out. And I will tell you this right now, my friends. I tasted eternal uh, separation from God. It is horrible. There's no rest, okay? You can't sleep. It's 24-7. Again, there's no 24-7. It just goes on and on and on. It's like a magnetic field, okay? I was stuck in this dimension for eternity. I had no purpose. There was no purpose where I was. I was just bebopping through my house like it was hor horrible, okay? It was horrible. It was horrifying, okay? I'm just bebopping through my house with no purpose. It was torment. It, it was isolation, you know, yet my girlfriend was in my experience, but, and she was laughing at me, actually. My girlfriend in my experience was laughing at me. She's saying, do things seem to keep repeating themselves? Like it was like demonic, okay? Then, and and, and you can say, you know, I'm going to say something to you here, okay? And you can believe it or not, but the voice of Satan or the voice of a demon said to me, gotcha, you fool, and was laughing at me. Now, I've heard other testimonies on YouTube. I've, I've watched them. I've seen them. I've heard them. And where they say Satan mocks and laughs, okay? And he was laughing at me. Gotcha, you fool. You know, and Jesus called people fools back in the day, okay? Like you're fools. Like, you know, you're serving the devil and everything. And Satan said to me, or a demon said to me, I didn't see a demon, but I heard the voice. He said, gotcha, you fool. Ha, 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 ha. He's laughing in this demonic voice. And I'm like, now I'm like, oh, my God. I know him in hell. You know what I mean? people it was real hell is real okay i'm not making this up this is a real story and hell is real and i said oh my god I i'm just like flipping out okay and the fear just started getting more and more and at after a point i couldn't even get to a happy thought i couldn't think of like uh i went to the beach with my daughters okay I you can't even think a happy thought it's total fear and i wasn't being tormented by demons okay i wasn't even being tormented like the the well, in the book of, of Luke where it says, you know, 19 verses 19 through 31 in there, you're being tormented by the demons. Like, I wasn't even being, tor being tormented physically. The mental anguish was crazy enough, my friends, okay? So here, here's what happens now. I kept praying, not praying, yeah, I was praying, I was speaking, God help me, Jesus help me. He did not come to my rescue. He let me He let me ride that out, my friends, on purpose, okay? He let me ride that out, so I, I knew what hell was, and I tasted eternal separation from God, okay? So then... I, I, I said to myself, I said, I said these words, I said, I choose life. I don't know what, I don't you know, I didn't even, that's in the Bible. I didn't even know it was in the Bible. Okay, I just said, I choose life. And all of a sudden, my soul, I guess it was my soul, came spiraling back out of the universe, okay? As my soul was spiraling back out of the universe, I was saying out loud, like, Oh my God, these people on earth here have no clue what awaits them on the other side. We live life every day and we bebop around and do good, do bad, whatever, okay? There is a hell, there is a heaven. I haven't tasted heaven yet. He hasn't shown me heaven. And, and I'm not worried about that because I have 200% faith. I don't need to see heaven. Some of you people here see heaven, you see Jesus, you see God. That's awesome. I don't condemn that. 
He hasn't given me the heaven uh, dream or vision yet, and that's okay. And I think he doesn't give it to me because I don't need to see it because I have 200% faith. Not even because of the hell experience. I just believe that Jesus is real. He died for my sins. He, he, he shed his blood on the cross. He rose on the third day. I believe it all. I have 200% faith. So I don't want to get sidetracked here. But I, but I came spiraling back and I said, people have no clue what's going on, what goes on when you cross over onto the other side. And God showed me that, people. And then when I came to, my, my soul went back into my body. I was on my bed and I was clammy, cold, sweaty, and I was white as a ghost, according to my girlfriend at the time. And she was sitting at the foot of the bed and she's, she's laughing at me. She goes, you all right? She says, you've been here for a while. You look like you've seen a ghost, you know? And I'm like... I, was, I wasn't laughing, people. I'm like, listen to me. I looked her in the eyes. Listen to me. We were fornicating, having sex. I wasn't in love with her. You know, we were just lusting, you know. And I looked her right in the eyes. Listen to me. I love you as a friend, but we're done. I'm not having sex with you anymore. I took my drugs and threw them down the toilet within, within 20 minutes or half hour, whatever. I threw all my drugs away. She goes, you know, don't throw that away. I said, just shut up. You know what I mean? I'm throwing my drugs away. I said, I was in hell. And, and let me tell you this, people. After that experience, like I slept with the light on for two months in my bedroom throughout my house. You know what I mean? It's just the evil presence, like it, it's powerful. There is evil in the world, okay? We fight spiritual darkness. We don't fight flesh against flesh, okay? So we do fight evil, okay? And then, so I broke up with her. I made amends with everybody that I had hurt in the past. I just felt it. But let me back up. After this experience, immediately God told me that the wages of sin is death, okay? And he said to me, you repent. If you don't repent, you're going straight to hell. You know what I mean? I'm like, wow, powerful stuff, my friends. I was glad. I couldn't believe I came out of that. I thought I was never coming out of it, my friends, okay? I thought I was never coming out of it. So I made amends with my ex-wife. I made amends with my children at the time, uh, girlfriends that I treated bad back in the day. I found them. I apologized to them. Anybody I wronged, I apologized to I just, I had to like redeem myself. I had to make it right, okay? So what I'm saying to you is like, you know, it really happened to me. Now I'm going to talk about something else. I don't watch secular television anymore. I don't watch TV. I don't go to the movies anymore. You can call me fanatic. I really don't care, okay? Um, I don't watch all that sin and lust and, and fornication and God's name in vain. It, it, it actually it grieves my spirit. And when it grieves my spirit, it grieves the Holy Spirit now. And when it grieves the Holy Spirit, it grieves Jesus and God and, and the whole, you know, Father, Son, and Holy Ghost. So we're all being grieved by it now. And, and, and don't judge me, please, because when, when you have a relationship with Jesus, it will grieve your spirit too. If it's not grieving your spirit, then you don't have a relationship with Jesus, okay? And I'm not judging you. I'm telling you the truth, okay? But hear me out. This is very important now. This is a very important part of my testimony. Three years later... I was still going to the movies back then. But three years later, I went to the movies. And I went to see the movie 1408. 1408. That's the name of the movie. 1408. I went to see the movie. And John Cusack was the actor. And in the movie, he's a person that doesn't believe in God. He investigates haunted houses. And he doesn't believe in demons. He doesn't believe in good or evil. And he pretty much hated God because his daughter, who was like, I don't know, 12 years old, she died of cancer. Okay, she died of cancer, and he was bitter. So he would make money on going to these supposedly haunted houses, and then he'd write a story about it. He didn't believe in, in the evil anyway. He's just making money, bebopping through life, okay? So what happens to John Cusack, it, now this movie came out three years later. So my near death, I didn't like make it up from the movie. The movie came out three years later. I just need to clarify that to you. I'm at the movies. I'm watching this movie, and his in his role, he's confined to this room, 1408 in a hotel. And he starts, like, hallucinating, and he starts to see people jumping out the window. There was a lot of suicides in there, and things like that, and evil, and, you know, demons. And he starts hallucinating. He starts going crazy. He starts losing his mind, okay? Um, all this, he has mental torment, mental anguish. I'm not going to get into, get into it. But he has mental anguish, just like me, mental torment. And then listen what happened. Here's my here's the breaking point of my testimony. This movie comes out three years later. He's in the hotel room. He says, okay, God, you win. You win, God. So he pulls out the Gideon Bible because every hotel has a Gideon Bible in it, okay? 
He pulls out the Gideon Bible, and he says, okay, God, you win. He turns, the no and I'm in a movie here three years later, and I'm in a movie. I'm alone now. He opens up the Bible, and every page was blank. He's flipping through the pages. Every page was blank, my friends. That movie came out three years later, okay? So my point to you is that I got goosebumps now telling a story right here in my arms. I got goosebumps when that happened in the movies, and God immediately revealed to me, your experience was real. Hell is real. See, for me now, God gives me confirmation on things, okay? He gives me confirmation, like in that movie. Yeah, it was a secular movie, but, you know, God can use those movies. I'm not promoting secular television. I just told you that. Otherwise, I'd be contradicting myself, but you know what? Go see the movie if you want to relate it to my experience. That's your choice. You know what I'm saying? You know, there was no sex in the movie. I'm just saying, you know, but, and there was, yeah, there was drinking, <laughs> but there was no sex, okay? But what I'm saying to you is that that movie came out three years later, and what are the chances of that? Really? You know, he opened up his Bible, and every page was blank, just like what happened to me three years prior. It's insane, my friends. It's crazy, okay? So now I'm going to wind down my testimony, okay? Here, here's where I'm going to wind it down. Don't you ever let a pastor priest, minister, I don't care, anybody in the church buildings, even on YouTube, whatever, don't you ever let anybody tell you that you're saved for your past, present, and future sins. Number one, if somebody tells you that, you will never bear any good fruit for the Lord. You will think that you're saved, and, and it's Satan's biggest lie. I have brochures when I go out and, and do evangelism in the street or in a mall, wherever I go, I have brochures that say Satan's biggest lie in the end times is one saved, always saved, and a sinner's prayer. There's, there's no such thing as a sinner's prayer in the Bible. It doesn't even exist, okay? It's not there. So, here we go. In 1986, a pastor told me, you know, Joseph, you're saved now for your past, present, and future sins. You are saved. You're, you're sealed by the, by the Holy Spirit, and you're, you're locked in, okay? I believed that lie. I didn't bear any fruits. I, I fornicated. I had sex. I did drugs. Uh, drank, you know what I mean? I was a sinner. I lied. I cheated. You know, I stole. Not criminally, but just stole. You know what I mean? It's crazy. You know, like, uh, well, like for a pencil, you know, I stole something from work, paper towels. You know what I mean? I guess it is criminal. Okay. But those, that's, a, that's, that's, that's the old days. That's gone. That's all history now. But what I'm saying is that, you know what I mean? Like, I, I just sinned, and I didn't bear any good fruit for the Lord. And then God showed me a dimension of hell. And the Lord told me, the wages of sin is death. And if you don't repent from your sins and follow me, you're going to hell. You know what I mean? So you could take this testimony for whatever it's worth. For those of you who believe it, that's awesome. For those of you who are skeptical, read your Bible. Get in the Word of God. He loves you. Jesus doesn't want you to perish. Okay? Satan just, you know, he, he uses churches and, and even ministries on YouTube. What I'm saying to you is that, you know what I mean? I, I, that pastor was sending me to hell. I believe that lie. Okay? Hell is real. It's very real, my friends. It's, I wasn't even in the real place, but I tasted eternal separation from God. And that mental torment, oh my God, it was crazy. You know what I'm saying? It changed my life. Okay? All right, people. So I love you. I appreciate you listening, okay? Um, anything else I have to add? Let me just think here. Um, I don't do drugs anymore. I don't drink anymore. I'm on a straight and narrow, okay? I don't watch secular television. I don't listen to secular music. I'm not on Facebook. I'm not on Twitter. These are my convictions, okay? And, and for, for some of you who might be scoffing at me, saying, yeah, you're a loser, you know, you know, are you having any fun in life? Absolutely, I'm having fun. I'm having fun. I shouldn't even say the word fun, but I, I enjoy, I have the joy. Let me rephrase that. I have the joy of serving Jesus, okay? I'm out there helping people, trying to help people to learn about Jesus. And, and I'm a seed planter, okay, to help them accept Jesus as their Savior, to, to tell them that they need to live on the straight and narrow Okay, they need to repent from their sins. Okay, we just can't do what we want. Because if that's the case, people, then we're all getting up into heaven. Think about it. You know what I'm saying? You know, if somebody molested your daughter, I think you would want justice. You'd probably want to kill the person, correct? So, you know, you'd, so, so if someone's born again and accepted Jesus as their Savior and they molest your daughter, oh, but they're saved. They're going to say to themselves, I'm good. I can go do it. I'm just using that 
that's just like a horrific crime. I'm sorry here, but I'm using like a worst case scenario. You know what I mean? So that so that Christian's getting into heaven without repenting, molesting a child. God talks about uh, harming his children in the Bible. You harm little children, you, your punishment's worse. Okay, and I believe there's different uh, degrees of punishment in the Bible. I really believe that. You know what I'm saying? So, you know what I mean? Like, we can't just do what we want, people. We need to serve Jesus wholeheartedly. He knows your heart. He sees everything you do. You know what I mean? For those of you who are cheating on your spouse, you can text your lover all day long, and then you can delete those texts before you get home to your spouse, okay? Number one, Google has everything. And, and, you know, Google and your, your, your cell phone provider, whoever it is, it's all there. Okay, that's how they catch sexual predators. You know, they delete everything, but it's still on the server. You know what I'm saying? My point here is that put the world aside. All right, so if Google and your, your cell phone provider are, 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 are saving that stuff, it's never deleted. You don't think God sees everything you do? Really? I already know he does. He's, he's done things in my life where I, I did a sin and I did this and he pointed it out to me like, I see everything. He said, and I'm not going to get into detail here, okay? Because that's between myself and God. But he pointed things out in my life. He said to me, I see everything you do, you know? Like, knock it off, you know what I'm saying? So, I love you people. I hope this uh, testimony, uh, I hope you were blessed by it. It's real. I'm not making it up. It's true. It really happened to me, okay? Uh, July 25th, 2004 at 10 a.m. on the morning on a Sunday in my house. Okay, it happened to me. Okay, I love you all. I hope this is a blessing. Feel free to leave comments below. And, uh, you know, today is January 2nd, 2016. Okay, and it took all this time to get the testimony going. Okay, and let me say this I'm going to add more here. I'm sorry. When I had this near death experience, I had a family member who was, you know, following Jesus. Okay, and he said to me, you know, you're not going to win people over by talking about hell. You know what I mean? Like, he discouraged me, and I'm like, yeah, but I, I you know, like I'm like, I saw hell. Like, you know what I mean? I got to tell people. And, he, you know, he said to me, you're never going to win people over by talking about hell. Like, win them over to Jesus. Well, that was wrong, my friends. So I'm putting it out there, not to condemn my brother, because I love my brother. Okay, I do. I love my brother. I'm not trying to put it out there here. But, he, you know, he discouraged me, and that was wrong. It was wrong on his part, but more importantly, I didn't. I wasn't obedient to the Holy Spirit back then. I listened to a man. You know what I mean? Even me. You know what I mean? Uh, someone like me, make sure I'm telling the truth. Get in your Bible. You know what I mean? I am, but if I make a mistake, correct me. You know what I mean? I would never make a mistake intention. I would never. Uh, uh, what's the word? Um, I, I would never deliberately, you know, put out you know false truth out there because I'll be held accountable. Okay. And I forgive my brother for that. Absolutely, I forgive him. It's all good. You know what I'm saying? But he said to me, like, well, no, you're never going to win souls about telling about your near death. Well, let me say this to you. I am winning souls now. Not that it's about me, but I am winning souls. You know what I mean? Don't listen to man. Don't listen to your pastor. I'm serious. Don't listen to your pastor. Go to Jesus, okay? You know, they say, well, you need to submit to authority. Jesus is your authority. A man will send you to hell, okay? Any man. Don't listen to man. But the Bible says and God says, do not, do not put your faith in man. Do not trust man. Don't even trust your neighbor, it says. You know what I'm saying? So I, I don't know. That just came to the Holy Spirit at the end here, you know. And again, I love my brother and I forgave him and it's all good. But you know what I mean? Like I'm winning souls now with this testimony. But I got about 25 other videos talking about other things than my hell testimony. So this is a foundation. Your testimony is, you know, when you turn to Christ, I, I, I encourage any of you here who has not made a video yet and God changed your life and you're serving him, make a video. It's not that hard. If you need help, you know, contact me. I'll talk you through it on the phone. You know what I'm saying? Put it out there, man. Jesus loves you. We are to preach the gospel to all nations and all creatures. You know what I'm saying? He commands us to do it. I'm an evangelism. I wear Jesus t-shirts. That's me. I'm not saying you got to do that. You know what I mean? You can evangelize in a more uh, low tone. Like I'm high energy, okay? I don't push it on people. I don't do that. I'm led by the Holy Spirit, but you can witness to people. Sometimes uh, you could just witness by not even opening your mouth. Just, just your, your spirit, you know? So... I love you people. I hope this encouraged you. God bless you. And uh, 
Praise Jesus. I love you all. Amen.